Agenda of the Future, presentation number five. I would like to welcome Anita Novak. She's the Director of Operations for Social Learning for Social Impact, MOOC. MOOC, that massive open online courses. You're from McGill University in Canada, so welcome on stage. Thank you, Leonard. Thank you. I can bear it for 10 minutes. Thank you, Leonard. Good morning, everyone. I want to start by thanking Hans for inviting me to speak today. I think it says a lot about the values of the GSBS that empathy is even on this agenda. I would like to thank Dr. Yunus for being an inspiration. His Nobel laureate acceptance speech is part of required reading in my course pack, and I think it should be required reading for every adult on the planet. Uh, I would like to thank the Jean Sauvé Foundation who made it possible for me to be here today. And I would like to put a shout out to all the McGill students here today, especially those representing my vision. It's a global movement of young people accelerating and incubating social business around the world. All 50 young challengers, please stand up so we can acknowledge you. You are part of the social business family, the next generation. We love you and we have high hopes for you. Finally, I would be totally remiss if I didn't mention I'm working on a MOOC. It's called uh, Social Learning for Social Impact, um, led by Henry Minsberg and Leslie Breitner at McGill University. All of you can participate in it. It is a, meant to be a global network uh, for people collaborating on social initiatives. You can pre-register today by Googling Social Learning for Social Impact. All right, I'm here to talk about empathy. What is empathy? It's a word we're hearing a lot about, but what does it really mean? I'd like to offer two ways to think about it. First, empathy manifests in two ways. There's cognitive empathy, which is the ability to imagine yourself in someone else's shoes, otherwise known as perspective taking. Reading fiction arouses cognitive empathy because, all the time because you're busy thinking about what the characters in the story are feeling. Then there's affective empathy which is when you physically and emotionally feel what someone else is feeling. Hollywood filmmakers understand effective empathy very well. So do photographers and photojournalists, and I want to prove this to you. I challenge you to look at this photograph and not smile. What's happening in your brain is that your mirror neurons are being engaged. But here's a photo on the other side of the spectrum, purposefully painful and dramatic to make my point. Kevin Carter took this iconic photo of a vulture waiting patiently for an emaciated child to die. It was March 1993 in South Sudan. Again, your mirror neurons are firing. So to recap, you can either imagine yourself in someone else's shoes, cognitive empathy, or feel what someone else is feeling, affective empathy. And when these two phenomena come into alignment, the power of empathy is infinite. The only thing stronger on the planet is love. Empathy trumps pity, sympathy, compassion, words that are often treated as synonyms when they are far from synonymous. I situate empathy on an altruistic emotion continuum. On one side is pity, which is an emotional response to someone else's pain or misfortune. But pity usually regards its object as inferior and sometimes even with contempt. The bottom line is when you pity someone, you look down on them. There is an inherent power differential. And unfortunately, a lot of foreign aid and philanthropy has been historically rooted in a paternalistic pity paradigm. But as you make your way across this continuum to empathy, that's where things get really interesting. Because when you empathize with someone, you recognize that you share a common humanity. We are all humans. We are all human beings. The only difference between us is we were born into different circumstances and have been given different opportunities, but we are all inherently worthy as human beings. And I believe that all good social business is predicated on empathy. We do the work that we do because we have empathy for others. The good news is that recent breakthroughs in neuroscience have confirmed what the mystics and sages have been saying for millennia. We are all born with the innate capacity to empathize, regardless of race, nationality, social, class, or age. But this isn't the story that often gets told. Why not? 
Based on behavioral observation of chimpanzees, we believe human beings are competitive, hierarchical, and violent by nature. But Dutch primatologist Franz de Waal said if we had spent the last 50 years studying bonobos instead, we would believe that human beings are cooperative, collaborative, and loving by nature. More good news is that we can all become more empathic. Just like you go to the gym and you build up your biceps, by doing curls, you can become more empathic with practice. And just to be sure, this is not just a female thing, men can become more empathic too. Here's a way of thinking about the process. Imagine being the first person to walk across a patch of land after a fresh snowfall. It would be a long slog because you're the one that's taking the first steps. Now imagine you're the next person who wants to cross the same vista. In all likelihood, you would follow in the same footsteps, right? It's easier that way. Now, as I was preparing for this talk, I realized that my slide was culturally specific. I'm from Montreal where we get a lot of snow, so here's a more culturally relevant photograph to consider. So with each new person who walks in the footprints of the person before, what happens? Well, a well-worn path gets created, just like this. Now, guess what? Breakthroughs in, re in neuroscience have revealed that everyone is born with approximately 100 billion neurons. And over time, based on life experiences, they weave beautiful synaptic connections into a complex network of ner nerve pathways, such as you see. This wiring takes place as a result of day-to-day -day living. And as one encounters repeat experiences over a lifetime, the denser the synapses become, much like the footprints in the snow. I know I'm oversimplifying the brain, but to make the point. So yet another piece of good news is that the power of empathic thinking and behaving is infinite. Consider this for a moment. Guess what this number represents? 10 to the power of 80. It's 10 followed by 80 zeros. That's a like, huge number. This equation represents the number of atoms in the entire known universe. But that number is nothing when you compare it to this. I said a minute ago that the adult brain contains roughly 100 billion neurons. And on average, each neuron has about 5,000 connections, synapses. So the number of possible combinations of 100 billion neurons firing is approximately 10 to a million. Every day, all day long, new neural pathways are created as a result of experiences that we're having and thoughts that we're thinking. Our brains are constantly changing. This is known as brain plasticity. So ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to ask an important question. What would happen if we all began thinking more empathic thoughts? But more importantly, what if we started engaging in more empathic action? Empathic action unleashes the true power of empathy because it requires us to confront social injustices not as spectators, but as participants committed to putting an end to indignity and suffering. That's why I believe we need an empathic action revolution. As everyone in this conference hall knows, we are facing a wicked set of social and environmental crises, unprecedented in scale, scope, and impact. Let's start with income inequality. There are 11 million millionaires on this planet. And at the same time, 60% of the global population lives on just 6% of the world's income. One in six goes to bed at night hungry. Nearly a billion people on the planet lack access to safe drinking water. And over a billion people lack access to sanitation facilities requiring them to practice open defecation. 100 million children are not in school, 60% of them girls. Meanwhile, hundreds of thousands of children are serving as child soldiers. Approximately 27 million people on the planet are currently being held as sex slaves or in some form of bonded labor. That is three times the number of people who suffered through the 300-year African slave trade. And finally, there's climate change, the most fundamental crisis to ever confront humanity. And the implications are so very grave. This piece of art is called Politicians Discussing Global Warming by Isaac Cordell. So yes, the world needs a lot more empathy, but we desperately need more empathic action. 
My final piece of good news is that engaging in empathic action is good for self and society. Once again, neuroscience is proving that we already know intuitively that doing good does the body good. Being in service lights up the same pleasure and reward centers in the brain as does cocaine, heroin, and even sex. Remarkably, engaging in empathic action also reduces stress, anxiety, and depression. It heightens immune system functioning, elevates self-esteem, improves personal relationships, and even boosts workplace productivity. In the face of social and environmental injustices, some of us feel rage, some of us feel impotent, others turn a blind eye. So as a final thought, I'd like you to consider these two quotes in juxtaposition. Each snowflake in an avalanche pleads not guilty. Not my fault. What could I possibly have to do with that great big old avalanche, right? Versus all the darkness in the world cannot extinguish the light of a single candle which of course speaks to the power of one. Think Gandhi, King, Mother Teresa, Mandela, and yes, our beloved Dr. Yunus. As far as I'm concerned, the difference between these two attitudes is empathy. As humans, we all have a deep-seated need to be in communion with one another and in service to one another, so we don't just need an empathic, empathic action revolution to thwart catastrophe. We need it to flourish as individuals. Now, the gong went, but if the organizers will indulge one little minute, I would like to invite a young woman up to the stage who exemplifies empathic action. Please help me welcome Salima Visram to the stage. So Anita told me last night that I would be speaking to you all today for a minute. Um, my name is Salima Visram, and I am a young challenger. Her question to me last night was, tell me about a moment in your life where you have felt the need for empathic action. This took me right back to a point where I was doing my IB, and I called my mom in tears, telling her I can't do my exam anymore, and I wanted to come home, and I needed to drop out of school. Her answer to me was, Salima, you have no right to tell me that, because just today, three girls from the village where you grew up were impregnated through child prostitution, and two of them tried to commit their own abortions and died. And these girls were younger than you. That day, I made a vow to find a solution to education and how it leads to child prostitution. Fast forward a couple years later, and I conducted interviews with so many social entrepreneurs, so solar experts, engineers, and social businesses from all around the world. Last week, I launched a social business based on a solar-powered backpack that I designed that would allow kids in rural areas to carry to school during the day and study at night. This would hopefully let them study and get through their education and not turn towards child prostitution. My wish is that no child in this world will ever have to go through child prostitution or modern-day slavery in, oh, as a way to earn income for themselves. Professor Yunus is a candle, we are all candles, and we all have a responsibility to ensure that every child in this world is a candle too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's it? Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Anita, and thank you very much, Salima, for jumping on stage spontaneously. Uh, Young challengers who got challenged. Anita, I have a question for you, because yes. there's the great news that McGill is starting a minor in social business. What's even more specific is that this has been driven by students who have been chasing their professors. Like, we want social business on the agenda. So maybe you tell us like one or two words about this program, what's happening there. Sure, the two co-founders of my vision are not here today. Uh, one of them is actually um, in interviews for a Rhodes Scholarship, no surprise. Um, they, like so many students across campuses around the world, are pushing up up through the institutions the need for social business to be on the agenda. And like you said, um, there's now a minor in social business at McGill, and the Desotel Faculty of Management launched the Social Economy Initiative two years ago specifically to bring uh, and integrate social entrepreneurship and social innovation education um, through the faculty. So there's a lot of things happening, and I encourage any student here today to do the same at your, at your university.
Absolutely. That's going to work. So guys, chase your professors and get social business on the agenda. Thank you very much, Anita. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> so now we're going to have a little video message um, that is coming from James Chow. James